Whitney, you're very welcome to the Scale X Insider podcast. I am really delighted and thrilled to have you on the show today. Brendan, thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. We've been chatting off air. You know our vision is to inspire, connect and enable millions of ambitious leaders of small and medium sized enterprises to scale with purpose. So Whitney, what does scaling with purpose mean to you? Mm. Love that question. Uh, for me, scaling with purpose is you're going up a mountain. Um, purpose means you know what mountain you are going up and why you're going up that mountain. So that would be purpose driven scaling for me. I really love that. That's the first time somebody's offered a metaphor to describe scaling with purpose and it aligns beautifully with what we always describe the scaling journey as summiting scale Everest. So beautiful. Look, I love your most recent book, Smart Growth. I have a copy here for those who are listening. Uh, you won't be able to see the smart growth, how to grow your people to grow your company. And really, I see that as a synonym for scaling with purpose. It's now a Wall Street bestseller and named as one of the 10 best new management books for 2022 by Thinkers 50. So well done you. But what led you to write the book? Mm. I had written two books prior to this, actually three books, but two books in this series. So one was called Disrupt Yourself and then the other one was called Build an A-Team. And they were all about this idea of personal disruption as a mechanism for making progress um, in specifically building a great team. One of the things I discovered though, is that in both books, I had something called the S curve of learning running in the background. It was like the backup singer. And I started to realize that maybe it needed its own book. Maybe it needed to be the lead singer when I had gone on Dan Pink's Pink Cast, and we were going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth of what we, we should talk about. And he said, Whitney, let's talk about the S curve. I was like, wait a second, like that's in the background. He's like, no, that's the thing. And so that was that realization of let's talk about this. Why do we want to talk about this? Because it is so simple. It is so visual and it gives people an understanding of what growth looks and feels like. And I wanted to write a book that would allow people to understand what growth looks like, because when you understand what it looks like, when you understand what it feels like, then you're going to increase your capacity to grow. Yeah. It, and we were chatting off there. This so resonates with me. I've, I've jumped on another S curve about three years ago and really, really enjoying that. We're going to come to that in a moment. You have a quote right at the beginning of the book, which I really, really love. If we are willing to step back from who we are, we can slingshot into who we want to be, who people need us to be. Explain to our listeners what you mean by that. Mm. So the background for that particular quote, this idea of stepping back to slingshot forward comes from disruption theory. I um, co-founded the Disruptive Innovation Fund with Clayton Christensen, and um, he was the father of disruptive innovation. He wrote The Innovator's Dilemma. And the idea around disruption is it's a silly little thing that takes over the world. And we know it from a products and services standpoint, where you had the telephone disrupt the telegraph, the automobile um, disrupt the horse and buggy. The big insight, the big aha that I had as I was working with and investing with Clayton is that disruption isn't just about products and services, it's also about people. And what happens when you disrupt is if you think about the Y axis of success and an X axis of time, basically on you're on this Y axis of success and you're say at a 12 and you're going over one, up one, over one, up one. Well, when you disrupt yourself, you make the decision to move down the y-axis of success from a 12 to a 10, because you believe that in the future, your slope of your line will be over one, up two, or over one, up four. And so you step back from who you are, for example, like when I left Wall Street um, to become an entrepreneur, you step back from who you are to slingshot forward because you believe that if you will do that in that future, 
that step back will allow you to be more successful, however you happen to be defining success. Yeah, again, there's so much in this, just to share with you, you know, and, and it's the reason that we, we do everything that we do in Simple Scaling. I've shared with you our vision. Lack of ambition of the leader is cited as the single greatest impediment as to why SMEs do not scale. Now, less than 1% of the 400 million SMEs globally actually achieve scale. Now, let me just put that in context for you. In the UK alone, there are 5.7 million SMEs who are contributing five who are contributing two trillion pounds worth of revenue to the UK economy. Mm -hmm. Half of that is coming from 34,000 companies, 34,000 SMEs who are achieving scale. So if we can just turn up the dial by 0.001% on those SMEs who achieve scale by encouraging them to embrace the S curve of learning, I feel that that's an antidote to actually this, mm. this challenge of lack of ambition. So, so let's wait, 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 wait. <laughs> my brain is bursting right now. So let's just stop for a half a second. Yeah. So I want to make sure I heard you correctly. So you're saying that less than 1% of all SMEs in the United States, I started to say United Globally, States. there are 400 million SMEs. Globally. Okay. So less than 1% globally scale. And you're yeah. saying it's due to lack of ambition. Now, I think that is fascinating. And yeah. I suspect you've done some research because when I hear that, I say to myself, is it lack of ambition or is it lack of vision and fear of oh, I couldn't possibly be that big. I couldn't possibly even think about that. I don't know if it's an ambition or, or, or thwarted ambition. So I just want to, I, and, and I agree the S-curve can help, but I just want to understand what do you see? What are you seeing? Because that's really interesting. Well, I don't agree that it's lack of ambition in terms of the, because we know we have worked with entrepreneurs, you know, our yeah. entire careers, they don't lack ambition. But what I feel happens is that they reach a certain point where fear sets in yep. and they get stuck where they're at. They either get caught in the bowels of the business doing all of this stuff and they can't even perceive that scaling that deliberate intention to actually scale this business is a way out paradoxically uh, mm -hmm. because they feel that that's about doing more. Uh, and, uh, and others get comfortable. We call them the comfort zone warriors. They want to kind of put this wall around where they've reached because they've, you know, they've risked less in the early stages, arrived at a point where they're now very comfortable and kind of want the world to stop and this to keep mm -hmm. delivering what they've already, um, what they're already enjoying. So that, that's, you know, when I read your book, I really thought if we can, if we can expose the leaders of SMEs to this concept of the S curve so that they understand if they just jump on it and understand what's going to happen at each stage, mm -hmm. then we can actually get a little bit more momentum with those who, that 99% who aren't. I love this. Okay. So, so can I explain the S curve really quickly? And Let's do that. Out. That's exactly what I, what I wanted okay. you to do. Cause this is, this is fantastic. It's just like all the synapses are firing. So, <laughs> so here's, here's what the S curve is. It's based on the work of Everett Rogers. And he looked at how groups change over time. Well, as we were using this to look at innovations and how quickly innovations were adopted, I had this insight, this aha, that we could use the S curve to help us understand how individuals change. So what it tells you and what's going on in your brain is that whenever you start something new, you're at the launch point of the S. There are, your brain is making a lot of predictions about what it's going to take to move to the top of that S, but because your predictions, many, many of which are inaccurate, um, well, you've got lots of predictions that are inaccurate, your dopamine, which is a chemical messenger of delight, it drops. 
And, and so what happens when you start something new is you have this feeling of being overwhelmed. You you're thrilled that you're here, but you're also overwhelmed and you're discouraged. And sometimes you get impatient. How come I'm not figuring this out faster? So you have the experience at the launch point of doing something new of growth. It, 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 it's, it's, it's actually happening, but it's not yet apparent. And so it feels slow and it feels like it's a slog. So it makes it difficult to start something new. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. Then there's a second part of the curve, which is the sweet spot. This is the steep, sleek back of the curve. And this is the place where you are starting to figure things out. Your predictions are increasingly accurate. So your dopamine is spiking. You're getting emotional upside surprises and growth not only is fast, it feels fast. And this is when people are actually in that place of scaling, which is what you're helping them do. Then there's the top part of the curve. This is again, flat. What's happening here? Well, you've figured it out. You, you've, you know how to do it. You know how to do, you've gotten your business to 2 million pounds and you know what you're doing. But because you're not learning at the same rate that you were once learning, your dopamine is flatlining. And so you now have a dilemma because on the one hand, you are at the top of a curve. You are master of all you survey. You're making those 2, pound, 2 million pounds. You said it's the comfort. What did you, saw, what did you call it? The, the comfort, comfort zone warrior. Oh, the comfort zone warrior. It feels really, really good. But the dilemma is, is that your brain needs more dopamine. The dilemma is, is that learning is the oxygen of human growth. The dilemma comes because you feel that there's more for you to do on this planet. You can feel it. And so now you have to make the decision. Am I going to stay in this place, the comfort zone warrior, which actually I can't stay here because if I'm not growing, I'm dying and my plateau becomes a precipice. So do you make a decision to have the top of this S curve become the launch point of your next S curve, <laughs> which is where you start to scale your business? Yes. And, you know, I'm, as you're describing that again, I'm thinking of the, the metaphor of scaling scale Everest at the base of that initial mountain, you can see the summit uh, ahead of you when you scale that, let's say to, you know, from your half a million pounds revenue to your 2 million pounds revenue, and you arrive at the summit of that, of that mountain, you will st- you will then be able to see another mountain ahead of you, which is the 20 million pounds revenue, or let's say in terms of impact, you know, you've, you've now you've impacted 2000 customers. Now you want to impact 20,000 customers, but that only becomes visible when you, when you take the action to, to, uh, on board the first S curve, you've got mm-hmm. to take the action. So you beautifully map six stages aligned to those three themes, the launch uh, mm-hmm. point, the sweet spot and mastery. Uh, you map those six stages onto the S curve. I would love Whitney, if we do a little mini masterclass mm-hmm. for our listeners today on those six yeah. stages. So, yeah. so what yeah. are they? And then we'll, we'll, we'll dig deep into them as we, as we move along. Happy to. And, and before we go there though, I just want to trace back on something. Cause I think this is really important as you're, you're thinking about your, your, your clients and the SMEs that you're working with is that this not only this map not only traces where you are, it tells you where you are kind of physically, but it also tells you emotionally where you are. So at the launch point, you're going to feel exhilarated and terrified. In the sweet spot, you're going to feel just mostly exhilarated. And in mastery, you're going to have that place of saying, I know I'm really good at this, but I can't keep doing it. I feel kind of bored. And when you can understand all the emotions that you're having, it allows you to navigate it and think there's nothing wrong with me. Oh yeah. I'm just struggling situation normal because I'm at the launch point. Cause I think that's really important. I I agree with you. And let's go back to lack of ambition to begin with. I feel that that's lack of know-how or lack of certainty about what's ahead and what you've done in your book is actually put language around the the emotions that people are going to feel you know we all crave certainty 
And we know, you know, again, it's, par it's a paradox. If you're in business, the only certainty is uncertainty. But what you've done is give language to the, the scaling journey ahead in terms of, okay, yeah, look, I know, you know, I'm now at the stage three and I know it's, it's okay to feel this way. It's, yeah. you know, it's messy. I feel like I'm not in control. I, you know, I can't see daylight. There's, I, I've lost the top of the summit fog has come in, you know, but, but it's it's at a cognitive level i feel a lot of leaders understand and are inspired by the concept of scaling and taking their wonderful product or service to a wider audience but they're reluctant to take that step to do mm -hmm. so to say mm -hmm. you know what i am going to scale so rather than do that they're simply waking up again tomorrow morning and go through the same motions of what mm -hmm. they've been doing for the last six months 12 months 24 months so right. let's yeah, okay. dive into All the right. stages. Let's, let's go. Yeah, let's go to the stages. All right. So at the launch point, there are two stages. There's the explorer stage and there's the collector stage. So let's start with explorer. So explorer stage is here you are on a brand new S curve. Maybe you chose to be here. Maybe you were pushed here. Sound familiar? Probably covers everybody. What decision you need to make here is, do I want to immediately jump off of this? Like I've just tried this new business idea. Do I want to stay here or not? And so you're exploring, you're asking yourself questions like, is this something that I is in alignment with my values? Is this novel, but not too novel? Is this something that I believe that I can achieve? And when I say believe that I can achieve, meaning do I believe that I could get to the point where I believe that I can achieve it? So back to this <laughs> lack of ambition, right? Is it really lack of ambition or is it, I don't know if I can. So you're asking yourself these, these explore questions. And if the answers to those questions are mostly yes, then what you say to yourself is, okay, I think I'm gonna stay on this S curve a little bit longer. I, I, I'm, on, I'm on this island. I'm going to stay here. Now what I want to do is I'm going to collect. I'm, I'm going to become a collector. I'm going to collect data. I'm going to effectively just figure out, is there a product market fit? Is there a person S-curve fit? And that's going to be data in the form of the market's giving you data. Um, people are buying your product or they're not buying their product. Do you feel like you're building momentum or you're not building momentum? Like you can decide I want to be, I want to get into good physical shape. You might decide to run. You might decide to cycle. You're going to do these experiments of collecting data, what's working, what's building momentum or not. And, and this is that place where you're also going to ask, do I want to do this? Do I want to do it? I, I'm, I'm gaining some momentum, but do I want to do it? So once you've collected that data, then you may decide, nope, wrong S curve for me. I'm going to move to the next thing. And we do this all the time. We don't even realize that we're doing it. Understand though, that when you jump to that new S curve, no S curve is ever wasted. We know from disruption theory that um, when you are willing to be disruptive, your odds of success are six times higher, but it's only 36%. So there's still 64% chance any curve you're on is not going to be the right curve for you. So you're going to collect data you're now gonna make this decision, do I stay or not? Well, if you stay, it's likely that you're now going to go into, well, actually, let me just say that. Don't stay here if you're not gaining momentum. It means you're flatlining. It means it's the wrong curve. What you want is if you're gaining momentum, you've now tipped into the sweet spot that Malcolm Gladwell popularized. You're moving into hyper growth. You're moving into that steep part of the curve. What do you get in the steep part? You get accelerator and you get metamorph. I said, this is the place where growth not only is fast, it feels fast. So how do you know you're in accelerator mode? Well, you've got this momentum. From a self-determination theory standpoint, what's happening? You're feeling autonomous. You feel this sense of control. You're feeling a sense of competence. Like, I think I'm, I'm getting this. Ooh, this feels good. And you're feeling a sense of relatedness, meaning you feel related to the people that you're doing the work with. Any company that's scaling really well, people feel connected to the people that they're working with and you feel connected to the work that you're doing. So this goes back to what you said, purpose-driven scaling. That's what's happening. So we call it CAR, C-A-R, mnemonic for you're going fast. Then as you continue up that S-curve, you're still not who you're going to be, but you're starting to be able to see the summit of who you could be. And then you move into metamorph. And this is a really interesting place because you're not there yet. You're almost there. You can almost see the summit. 
And this is the place where you can very easily get derailed of getting distracted because you're so competent. You're getting lots and lots of opportunities. You have to say to yourself, no, I need to say that I need to stay here. I need to see this through. I need to allow myself to actually become this thing that I am working to become. So that's the metamorph phase. Still fast, feels fast. And then you get to mastery. Mastery is the top of the mountain. And there's two places here. There's anchor and there's mountaineer. So anchor is a phase that many, 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 many of us overlook. You have now become what you wanted to become. You've done what you wanted to do. It is important that you stop for just a moment and mark the moment because you did it. And you need to honor that you did whatever it is you were trying to do. At the same time, you know that it's a bit transitory because the plateau can become a precipice. So there's some, there's some grief because you know that you're no longer going to be able to keep doing what you're doing because you need to keep growing. You need to keep changing. So you need to mark the moment. You need to celebrate. You need to grieve just a little bit. It's a moment of poignancy because something's over. And then you move to mountaineer phase. And that's that phase that you described earlier where you say to yourself, all right, either I'm going to jump to an entirely new S curve or I'm going to say, hmm, this is a summit, but not the summit. So effectively you push yourself back into the sweet spot. So that 2 million pound business that's saying, I'm going to go to 20 million. Yep. I'm in the sweet spot. Let's keep going. And you keep climbing and you start the cycle all over again. Now, what I would say, people talk about peak performance being at the peak of the mountain. I believe I would submit to you that peak performance is the ability to navigate all aspects of that growth cycle, the ability to navigate a launch point, the sweet spot and mastery and do it all over again. So that's your map of what growth looks and feels like. Brilliant. I want to come back. There's something that I know certainly the leaders listening will arrive at a point where they're trying to discern through in that in that initial launch point and let's let's use let's use this the 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 jumping on to the s curve mm -hmm. as your intention to scale because it 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 Great. is deliberate it. and it's intentional mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. i am going to scale and we know that there's 99 percent of smes out there who are not scaling that they are simply kind of you know every every day every week every month looks like the same it was 12 months ago 24 months ago and they've got these wonderful products or services that i feel that they're obligated to bring to the world but they number one they, they don't have the language or a, or a map like the s curve to actually make this jump so let's let's say that scaling is the the intention it's the mm -hmm. i'm going to jump onto the That's scaling the s curve That's, That's it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Scaling now, how, how do they discern in the explorer and collector phase between I'm not gaining momentum. I'm going to jump off this. I'm going to stop mm -hmm. this. And it's simply being tough and them having to mm -hmm. keep moving through this. Mm -hmm. How do you discern the difference there, Whitney? Mm, such a great question. Um, so I, I think the reason it's such a great question is because when we do something new, it feels really uncomfortable as we have established. And we also know that the older that we get, and I know that more and more entrepreneurs are in their forties and fifties, um, the older we get, the more we can insulate ourselves from ever doing anything new. So we're actually really bad at doing new things. So I would say that the way that you differ, one of the ways that you can differentiate between this is a bad idea and it just feels bad right now is to ask your, is to go back to your explorer questions. Do, is this in align with my alignment with my values? Is, um, is the market telling me that this product is actually, people buy this product and they like it. it I know it's slow, but people are connecting to this product. And then there's one other important thing, because I think this is where truth tellers come in. Everybody needs truth tellers. They might be your family members. They might be your friends. Your friends and family can tell you 
you're just afraid, or this is just hard right now. You've got something here. You, it is true that it may not work, but right now you don't have enough data to know whether it's going to work or not. So what you need to do right now is you just need to keep going. Yeah. So go a little bit longer. And I don't want to confuse people in terms of the, the one of the stages is anchor, but at, at that stage, we need something to, we need another foothold. We need, we need a, a piece of the mountain to grab onto. We're looking around and we can't, we can't see anything to grab onto. What, what would you say is, is really important for us to, 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 uh, to lean into at that point, you know, because your, your network will be critically important in terms mm -hmm. of surrounding yourself with those truth tellers, as opposed to, as one of our guests said before, a lot of leaders surround themselves with time tellers, not truth tellers. So we need to surround ourselves with truth tellers. Mm -hmm. What else should we be looking for as the kind of the metaphorical foothold, just to gain a little bit more momentum, if it's only a couple of inches, just to get, get mm -hmm. unstuck. When you're, when you're at the launch point. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and, uh, some more, so a couple of other, other suggestions. Number one is I would say harness the power of dopamine. So we talked about dopamine a minute ago about how it drops when you're at the launch point in the sweet spot, it spikes and then in mastery, it, it, it flatlines. Well, we know that dopamine comes to us when we beat expectations. And so one of the ways, one of the hacks that you can use at the launch point is you can start setting for yourself these really small goals that will allow you to beat expectations. And there are different ways that you can do that. You can do BJ Fogg's tiny habits. You can do James Clear's atomic habits. You can use um, Jeff and Jamie Downs streaking app where you just have in this app, I'm going to do this every day. But you set these very, very, very small goals at the launch point of, I'm not going to make 10 phone calls today. I'm going to make one phone call, or maybe I'm not even going to make a phone call, but I'll look up the email address of the person that I need to reach out to. You start setting for yourself these very small goals. You also write down the things that you did that weren't on your list so that you can get that dopamine. So at the launch point, sometimes, yes, you want to see the mountain, but sometimes you have to not think about the mountain. You just need to think about one foot in front of the other so that you don't feel overwhelmed by, by the enormity of what you feel like you want to and can accomplish. The second thing that I would say, and this comes back to the truth tellers, there's some great research out of the University of Virginia. They had people look at a mountain and estimate the slant of the mountain. Well, when they looked at the mountain on their own, it wasn't really a mountain, it was a hill. When they looked at the mountain on their own, they <laughs> looked at the hill on their own. They said, I think it's 49 degrees. Then when they have someone look at the hill with them, so a trusted colleague or partner, a person that they felt safe with, their brain immediately adjusted and they didn't say it was 49 degrees. They're like, I think it's only 44 degrees. So it immediately felt more doable and less daunting because they were looking at it with someone else. But then here is the best part. When they put their foot on the hill, they took the first step they started their brain recalibrated to recognize that in fact, it was only 26 degrees. <laughs> wow. So wow. look at what you're doing with someone that you trust, a truth teller, it will become less daunting, more doable, and importantly, start, but start small because that will make it seem like you can do it. And then you'll get the dopamine that'll help you do it. And then you can persist a little bit longer to get the data that you need to figure out if in fact, it does make sense to do it or not. Whenever you mention this, I'm thinking back to one of the wonderful CEOs who participated in our SkillX Accelerator program in 2022 and graduated at the end of the year. And he, he went through this period and other guests have termed this the, the, kind of the valley of darkness, you know, after the elation of creating a, a wonderful vision, the realization of actually executing this and feeling so much resistance from, from others because of the, the enormity, the ambition level around the vision and the change in business model. And he was going through a really challenging time personally. He intuitively believed in this 
but was was feeling a lot of resistance. What do you recommend to uh, to to the leaders on a personal level to ensure that they protect their their you know the the sanctity of their emotional state at that point? What can they do to to kind of gain the energy? to move through that valley of darkness or, you know, beyond the, the collector stage into the accelerator stage. So beyond the, um, you know, and I love that, you know, taking little tiny steps, I call it, you know, the, the minimum viable action, mm -hmm. forget about the big lofty goals. What's the Got next it. step that you can take regardless mm -hmm. of how small, as long as it's a step forward, but what else, because there's, there are things that you mentioned in the metamorph stage, which I you know, almost think, you know, that we need to see sight of before that stage in terms of preserving our our state. Um. All right, I, my head's going in a couple of different directions, but it sounds like you might have something in mind. So, is there something in mind that you want me to talk to? Well, yeah, I, I suppose what where I think of is that, you know the. I come back to the work of Dr. Jim Lear, who I had in the podcast previously, you know, and, and you know, managing your physical energy, the, which ultimately okay. undergirds your mental energy, which undergirds your emotional energy, which, you mm -hmm. know, uh, which allows you to really tap into your purpose. And I'm wondering, given. Perfect. You know, OK. <laughs> OK. Yeah, because my brain was going to go a totally different way. Um. So so thank you for for clarifying. Yeah. I, so one of the things that we talk about in the metaphor metamorph stage is that the importance of the physical ability. I mean, we talk about, we keep using this mountain metaphor. I mean, to move up a mountain, you need to be physically strong. You need to be yeah. in shape. You need to, your legs need to be strong. You need to have stamina. You need to be able to climb that mountain. And so I would say, and in fact, one of the things that I oftentimes do in my coaching is when people are saying to me, you know, CEOs are saying, oh, I'm struggling right now. One of the questions I'll ask them is, are you sleeping? Are you exercising? Are you taking a walk? How are you eating? Because if you, um, if you're doing all of those things, that's going to inform your ability to emotionally regulate and your ability to emotionally regulate is going to, um, determine your ability to move through this dark night of the soul, which you you're going to have as an entrepreneur, you are, but if you're physically strong and you're, I'm going to say spiritually strong and emotionally strong and you've got that purpose, you know why you're doing this, you know, you feel like it makes sense to do, that is going to allow you when you're in that moment of like, I don't know if I can do this, you will be able to do it because you'll have the capacity to do it. Yeah. And you, know, you will relate to this. I, you know, I, I, I coach a number of CEOs on a one-to-one -one basis, as well as those who, who are participating on our program. And I recommend all of those, all of those kind of the, those physical practices, the mental practices, the emotional practices, and people will take these on board. They will practice them. They will feel good. They start to get momentum. And then I'll get a call a couple of months later saying, oh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm about to throw the towel in and it's, and it's, it's all crazy and, and I can't do this anymore. And I go, just explain to me again your evening routine and your morning routine. Well, it was all going well, but I kind of abandoned. I I got too busy, and I and I and I kind of I'm not getting time to do all of those things. And I, people forget very quickly when they, uh, you know, it's like when we're in good health and we've worked hard to get into good health we abandon the practices and disciplines that actually got us in good health in the first place. And this is, you know, it, it, this also resonates and aligns to kind of the things you do to get into the point where you're actually getting momentum scaling, you yeah. abandon them then once you start to get that, that little bit of acceleration. Do you find the same, Whitney? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I think it's so interesting and it's also, um, yeah, I don't have time to exercise. Well, yeah. no, if you don't have exercise, you won't have time. So you yeah. need to exercise. But also I think it's interesting. You see this sometimes this idea of abandonment is that you see people move into the sweet spot and you see this with individuals, especially where they're like, everything's going great. And then all of a sudden all these people want to hire them and then they go and they get lured away and then they, they, they arrest their development because they don't complete the cycle. So mm -hmm. 
there, there are all sorts of pitfalls in that sweet spot. You can derail very easily. And one of the things I actually talk about is the importance of focus. Stay focused on what you are doing so you get to the top of the curve and exercise, eating right, sleeping. See, I've got a whoop on my wrist. Yeah, I wear the aura as well. Yeah, so. there you go. You've got the aura. I've got the whoop. <laughs> yeah. Whoop, whoop. Um, so uh, yeah, to, to help us be healthy so that our bodies can do what we need them to do to do the work that we feel like we're meant to do. Yeah. Listeners to, to the podcast on a regular basis will have heard me saying before, you know, I use the little acronym sense to, to appeal to the listeners on the scaling journey to regularly have a sense check. And I, you know, S is for sleep. You know, how is your sleep? How many hours are you getting? E is for exercise. What is your exercise regime? How is it looking at the moment? N is for nutrition. S is for self care. You know, are you taking time out from the scaling journey to mm -hmm. do those things that really energize you and refresh you and, and renew you? And E is having that enduring growth mindset. Ah. So that's, uh, you know, it's something that I, that I encourage people to do on a regular basis. If you're not feeling it, just take time to, to, to sense check. So yeah, we're well, very, you know, we're very aligned on that. Yeah. Going back to what you were saying earlier. So I, I mentioned it in that metamorph stage where you're going fast and you said sometimes people derail there, but to, back to your point, when you're at the launch point, if you're feeling like, oh, I don't know if I got this in me, that's when you need, you need to sense check there as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Something, you know, that again, we, we advocate and it's part of our approach within our, our scale X accelerator program is lead self first before you lead others, before mm -hmm. you lead the organization. Mm -hmm. And part of the challenge I feel why there's less than 1% actually achieving scaling is that people aren't grasping this, that in order to actually, essentially the, your team's growth is a factor of your growth. The organization's growth is a factor of your team's growth. Can you speak to that? Because I know that resonates with your, with this work and your previous work as well. Yeah. Only. You see me mo nodding my head. <laughs> yeah. Yes, 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 yes. yeah, I mean, absolutely. So one of our, our core tenets is, is that companies don't disrupt people do that the fundamental unit of growth in any organization is the individual. And I, the big aha that I had when I was working with Clayton on Wall Street and, and thinking about disruption is it wasn't just about products and services, but it was about people. And so if you're going to scale a business, if you're going to transform anything, as you said, it comes, it starts with you, you need to disrupt yourself first. And then because of the contagion effect, if you're disrupting yourself, if you're growing, then that will create space for other people to grow as well. And then the outcome of all of that is that your organization will grow. Um, but if you don't do it yourself, it's just not going to happen. And what are the, what are some of the challenges for people when they, when they begin that or decide on that growth journey? Where, where do they start Whitney and what are they, what will they expect to encounter in terms of how they're going to feel? Because, you know, again, we're, you know, we've, we're, we've been CEOs of, of scaling organizations. You continue to lead a, a scale up. The, we, we almost are expected to be in control, mm -hmm. to, to kind of have this kind of easy confidence and, and level of control within the scaling journey. What I, what I'm careful of here is not to kind of unsettle our listeners in terms of the, uh, I'm going to be, a, I'm going to present myself as a rack to my leadership team if I embark on this yeah. kind of disruptive growth journey. So, so can you, can you speak to that in terms of what the leaders are going to expect when we talk about lead self or grow self, mm -hmm. what, what does that practically look like? And what, what am I going to feel as a leader when I begin that journey? Oh. Such a great question. Um, I think it looks like a, I, I'm going to riff for a minute because I it's not fully formed, but I'll, I'll give you a couple of ideas and then we can make something out of it. So I think the first place it starts is that you yourself are doing the work. So you you're doing that now as you talk about the growth journey. Um, 
for anybody who's a parent, I think there's a little bit of this is it's, it's knowing when you're giving too much information. So when you are on this growth journey, are you asking people to hold it for you? Are you asking people to take care of you? Or are you just talking them through, here's what's happening. Here's what I'm learning. Here's what I'm trying to figure out. Here's what I'm doing differently as a consequence. I want to share it with you so that you can learn from what I'm learning and also so I can support you as you do it. But I am not in any way asking you to hold this for me. And I think that that's, that's what it looks like. I, I do think about this a lot because I have a newsletter and I tell lots of personal stories. It's, it's always a question of, have I processed this enough so it's not raw? I can talk about it. Can I talk about it from a place of learning? And more importantly, can I talk about this growth journey that I'm on in a way that it is in fact in service of you and your growth journey? And let me give you a very specific example. So as you said, I'm part of a scale up right now. And late last year, my business partner and I, Amy Humble, we had this big, long conversation um, and sort of work session of thinking, all right, we're, we're kind of transitioning because it's not just about Whitney, the thought leader, it's about disruption advisors and the work that we're doing. And that required that we needed to reallocate who was doing what. And in that process of reallocation, there was some loss there. And, you know, she was not going to do some things that she had been doing. Um, I was going to not do some things that I'd been doing. Um, I was going to start doing building the financial model, which she had been doing, even though it didn't make sense because I have a background on Wall Street. All that is to say, we went through this. It was a little bit of an emotional process, which you wouldn't expect, but it was. We then shared with our entire team, hey, we had this conversation. We realized that we're evolving as a company. We started to change some priorities. It was a little bit hard to do. We're disrupting ourselves, but we're figuring that out. And this is our commitment is we figure this out. We're going to help you figure out how to disrupt yourself so that you can continue to grow and make progress as well. So again, talking through the process out loud, but not asking them to hold it. It's more as I'm talking to you as the guide going up the mountain. I'm sharing this with you so that you feel like you're going up the mountain with me together. And maybe there's a thing or two that I've learned that will help you as well. Yeah. And again, I love that. And, you know, we talk about and certainly advocate through through the, this journey of scaling, it's so critically important to manage yourself, to lead yourself through that growth journey. Ultimately, we want you to arrive at the summit of Scale Everest, you know, feeling that you have really accomplished something significant, that you've challenged yourself along the way, and that you, as you rightly encourage, you know, you, you take stock and acknowledge what you've achieved. And you're feeling confident about kind of when you look up again, the next summit, that your team is right there beside you saying, this was really challenging, but you know, we've enjoyed the growth that we've, we've also experienced as a result and the organization has grown. And again, I'm, this is an appeal and I'd love you to speak to this as well, Whitney. This is an appeal to the listeners. It was Gary Ridge, the, the ex CEO of of WD40, who I interviewed in the podcast a number of seasons ago, and he said, you know, don't let your desire to remain in the comfort zone be the blocker of someone else, mm -hmm. it, someone else's experiencing growth or someone else unlocking their potential. And it speaks to what you had mentioned again at the outset of the book, that the greatest force on earth is human potential. And that, that when we really when we really kind of latch on to this concept of leverage, leveraging that human potential, then our own momentum will ultimately create momentum within our team and, and momentum in the organization. That's a little bit of a riff, but can you speak to that in terms of the importance of actually when you, you know, in the context of scaling for you really to, to seek to grow yourself, challenge yourself, get curious, you know, get comfortable with being uncomfortable so that ultimately you can unlock the potential and leverage the potential within your team. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's interesting. Um, first of all, love Gary Ridge. What a great leader. Yeah. Uh, but um, interesting to think about when you are at the top of an S curve and this idea of unlocking potential, 
Um, let me tell you a quick story and then I'll, I'll tell you the, the lesson learned. So a, a company that we work with, it's, it's called chat books. They turn Instagram photos into uh, physical photo books. And one of the things that we saw happening, we had this, the, the founder bring us in, administer our S curve insight tool. And they found that many of the people were in mastery. One per particular person was in mastery and shouldn't have been, cause he'd only been in the role for about six months. When they started to have a conversation about roles and responsibilities, the reason that the president in this new role was a mastery was because the person, the CEO, who had promoted him was still doing some of his work. What does that mean? He had gotten to the top of an S curve, the CEO, and said, I'm going to jump to a new S curve and I'm going to let you, the president, now have all of this summit to yourself. But because it was comfortable to be on that particular mountain of an S curve, he was still doing some of that work. And so that meant that the summit wasn't at 10,000 feet. It was at 5,000 feet because the CEO was still doing the president's job. So when you get to a summit and you're feeling like this is really comfortable, there are two things that are happening. Number one is you need to keep growing. You need more dopamine, so you need to keep climbing. But there is also a very, very, very strong possibility that if you stay there, you are going to stunt someone else's growth. I had I had um, someone say to me that they know it's time for them to move on when they've taught or imparted everything that they could to the people on their team. So I would take that Gary Ridge story that you had, this chat book story that I had and say, I can be at the top of the mountain. It means there's more for me to learn, but it also means if I stay here, the people around me won't be able to learn. So you've got that double motivation to keep climbing. So let's, on the, you know, on the, the, the kind of the interest of continuing with metaphors, if we visualize a hundred people in a room, a hundred leaders and they well, let's say they're, they're, both, of, both of them are, are elevated on a platform mm -hmm. and uh, we have 100 leaders elevated on a platform and there's a space and there's another platform. One of them has taken the jump. One of them standing on the other side, which is the, the kind of the scaling S curve. And we've 99 still stuck because this platform feels as comfortable. Again, as much as cognitively we can we can understand that the attraction of making this leap is is real and the 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 desire to stay where we are is so strong what can we dangle in front of the the 99 leaders that are standing in this platform that precedes scaling to get them to make that jump what wow. is the what is the what what one or two things will really magnetize them to stop yeah. thinking about the comfort zone that they're on and make that jump yeah okay it's a great question I, and i love the the visual imagery so what i would do is i would lose loss aversion theory in your favor so we know loss aversion theory, Daniel Kahneman, Amos Tversky, is that we're more motivated by what we lose than by what we gain. And so when we're at the top of that mountain and thinking, I need to jump, it's going to be so exciting, that's what you're going to gain. But we're actually not as motivated by that as what we'll lose. And so one of the ways that you can motivate yourself when you're there is to start thinking about what am I going to lose if I stay here? And that can be a very motivating force. If I stay here, if you want to start spinning it out, if you've got a board, you may not have a board this small of a company, but if I stay here, then maybe I'll stagnate and the board will kick me out. If I stay here, maybe I'm going to start dialing it in and our products are going to fall behind. If I stay here, one of my star employees is going to move because they don't have more opportunities to grow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you can start looking at what bad thing will happen to me if I don't jump, that's the thing you want to start to dangle. Yeah, that's, that, that resonates so strongly. On that note, how important is it to, to think about others rather than yourself mm. as, in terms of acting as, a, as, a, as an incentive as a motivator to make that jump? How powerful is it whenever we start to think about 
the you know contributing to our team and and in terms of appealing to our leaders should they put the team first rather than all the things they're thinking about in terms of uh, what they could potentially lose from making this jump i think it's a both and i i think our starting point is ourselves, just because we're because we're human and we're yeah. going to start with ourselves. <laughs> um, but I think if we can, I, I think it's a way to, to amp it up. So, okay, what good thing could happen if I did this? Blah, 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 blah. What bad thing will happen to me if I don't do this? Or, you know, yeah, if I don't do this and you can amp it up. But then if you want to get people to that higher order thinking and um, to say to themselves, okay, so what good things will happen to the people around me if I make this move? Um, Tom Rath made this wonderful comment, which is contribution is the sum of what grows when you're gone. And so if you're in that place where you can think about the good things that will happen, the bad thing that would happen, and also then move to this bigger place of what are the good things that are going to happen for the people around me? If I will make this move, how are they going to grow? How are they going to develop? What will my legacy be? If I do all those things that can help you, um, that can further motivate you. But I don't think that that's going to be your starting point. I think it's going to be once you sort of care for your basic need of, okay, I need to feel safe. That's going to allow you to go to that next place. Yeah. Um, you mentioned at the, 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 the earlier part of the conversation, the, the, the privilege and honor that you had working alongside the wonderful Clayton Christensen. Mm -hmm. What did he leave you with? You know, if you could relay three things to our listeners that that Clayton Christensen left you with as a mentor, as a friend, as a coach, what would those be, Whitney? Well, I think there's the obvious of just his intellectual property. I mean, I think about all the work that I've done. It I it it, it stands on his shoulders without a doubt. Disruption. Um, learning, I mean, all the work that I've done stands on his shoulders. So I would start there. I think the second thing I would say is that he um, was a deeply, deeply good man and very, very purpose-driven, very values-driven. And it was amazing to watch him in action. Also very intellectually curious, clearly. Um, and then I could say the third thing that I think about a lot is that he did not he didn't separate the secular from the spiritual. So um, I saw him, he was the same person at church. So he would bring all of his intellectual wattage and, and acumen into his spiritual life. But then I would also see him bring his spiritual life, who he was at the core into the work environment. And that's how you got a book like, How Will You Measure Your Life? And Almost that to me was again, apart from the IP, which is foundational, the thing that I think about a lot is this idea of how do I make sure that I am combining my secular with my spiritual life, that I am, my whole self is showing up to do the work that I do. Yeah, it's, it, it, I can, I, you know, I can't, well, I can't imagine what it, what it was to work with such a, a great man and it's mm -hmm. interesting you know many of the guests that i've had on the wonderful guests who speak so intelligently so so beautifully so colorfully uh, and so deeply about their subject matter have known or have had the the privilege of working with clayton christensen he's such a he, you know he's almost the golden thread that runs through mm -hmm. the guest profile of mm -hmm. that we have on the on the show so uh, i get the benefit of actually hearing from people who have who have yeah. the, the honor of working with them uh, you co-founded you mentioned at the outset the 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 disruptive innovation fund with the late great clayton christensen as I understand, you invested and led an $8 million seed round for South Korea's Coupang, and it's currently valued at more than $25 billion. Am I right? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We were, wow. we were very fortunate. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I mean, what, in your view, should business leaders be looking for when acquiring or investing in other businesses as part mm. of their scaling journey? Yeah, I well... I'm going to give you a very obvious and expected answer, which is, um, do you have 
in place as you're thinking about scaling your business? Do you have mechanisms in place that will allow you to scale your people? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's very profound. I mean, we, our third principle of our ScaleX framework is people. Our fifth principle is process and systems, and certainly those those processes should be in place so that ultimately you scale your people. The more you can scale your people, ultimately uh, you will you will you will scale your organisation. As we mentioned earlier on, to a factor of that. I cannot believe uh, we're we're already recording for over an hour. The last hour has absolutely flown. I have loved this conversation. Is there anything before I move into our close, Whitney, that you would like to uh, you'd like to uh, leave with our audience that we maybe haven't addressed in relation to your wonderful book, Smart Growth, or or some of your other your some of your mm -hmm. other work in the context of scaling. Um, I would say I'll, I'll just summarize briefly is that um, when you're thinking about upside, when you're thinking about scaling a business, um, you think about your people and use the S curve as a way for you to think about the what growth looks like, what growth feels like to recognize that it's slow and then fast and slow. Once you've got this simple model, it's going to help you scale your people. And it's also going to help you scale your business and have this framework for for how it can unfold and, and navigate it a little bit more easily. Yeah. I always close with this question and you've had such and continue to enjoy such, such rich, wonderful experiences. I must acknowledge you for the, the incredible work that, that you uh, deliver to the world selflessly. We were chatting off air. I mean, people have heard from the bio, you have 1.8 million LinkedIn followers. To put that in context, I have 4,000. So <laughs> they, uh, you, you know, people really value what you're doing, Whitney, and you must be commended on that. Can you provide our listeners with three timeless takeaways? Mm. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to be recapping what I said, but, but that's okay. So my, my first is that, um, companies do not disrupt people do yeah. the fundamental unit of growth in any organization is the individual. And so if you will help, if you yourself will grow, then you're going to be able to help your people grow. And if you help your people grow, then your organization will grow. Hear, hear. Whitney, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to host you on the ScaleX Insider today. I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. What's next for you? Lunch. <laughs> and after lunch. Um, what's next for me? Well, I would say in terms of the business, as I said, we're, we're in this scale up mode right now. We are very much focused on, um, building out and developing our S curve insight tool that will allow people to get the insight to see where they are in their growth. Because again, once you know where you are, then you know what's next. So that's our, our big project for this year. Brilliant. Well, I wish you all the very, very best with that. And if, people want to reach you other than LinkedIn, Whitney, uh, given your wonderful profile on LinkedIn, we're, we're, be, we're best to connect with you. Um, the easiest place is just to um, email me at wj at whitneyjohnson.com. Oh, no, sorry. We changed our email addresses. wj at the disruptionadvisors.com. We just there, changed. There we go. Well, look, I wish you all the very best in the future. Uh, continue to, to grace the world with your wonderful work. And thank you again for your time, energy, and wisdom today. It's been a real pleasure to host you on the show. Brendan, thank you for having me. It was, it was a lot of fun. Take care.